welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, we begin a series on the metaphors for the church with a look at the church is a body, specifically the body of Christ. Let's listen. Well, as you heard from Pastor Dana, we are starting a new series today and titled The Church is a blank. And each week we're going to fill in the blank with a metaphor that the scriptures use to describe what the church is. So today, the church is a body. But it's not just any body. The church is the body of Christ. Now, as we go through this series, I don't want you to think only about the church in abstract. I want you to bring this always back to our church, to our context. So think today about unity. Unity is a body. More than that, unity is the body of Christ. Now, we see that term, body of Christ, a couple of times throughout the New Testament. The first uh, instance that we're going to study today comes from Ephesians. It's the letter that Paul wrote to the church, the body of Christ, in Ephesus. We will start in chapter 1, verse 22. When Paul says this, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over everything for the church, which is his body. Okay, that's our starting point as we are studying the body of Christ today. So what did you notice from this verse? Well, what I notice is that God appointed Jesus to be the head of the church. And if Jesus is the head, that means we all get to be the body. And what can a body do without a head? Well, not much, right? The image I get is this one, which I love because it's just a a body without a head that I imagine wandering into walls, kind of wandering aimlessly around, because if you don't have a head, you don't have eyes to see. You don't have ears to hear. And more importantly, you do not have a brain. A body without a head has no brain, and the brain is what really directs us to move, isn't it? Uh, The brain is what sends signals to our muscles whenever we want to move our arms, legs, our feet, and our toes. Uh, The brain sends sensory neurons uh, to our senses whenever we touch something and we know how it feels, or whenever we need to see something, experience something with our senses. Yes, a body without a brain, is not going to do very much. And so in this metaphor, Jesus is the brain. Jesus is the head, which means Jesus is the one who directs this church. Jesus is the one who directs the church to act. The the church should never be acting if Jesus as the head, as the brain, hasn't sent that signal first. If the church is the body of Christ, then the church does not act on its own accord. That would be like a body just stumbling into walls without the head directing it. We must only act when Jesus is the one sending us those signals to say this. This is what you are to do. Now, how does that work? How does Jesus want us as his body to really act? Well, to understand that, Let's look back to how Jesus used his body when he lived on this earth 2,000 years ago. What did Jesus do uh, with his enfleshed being? Well, when I read the Gospels, when I look at how Jesus acted in those Gospels, what I see is that Jesus is using his physical body to demonstrate God's love in the most tangible and visible ways possible. And in the 2,000 years since Jesus' death and resurrection, it is the church that now acts as this extension of Jesus' body. So it is the church that must demonstrate God's love in the most visible and tangible ways possible. Now remember, we are making this applicable to us. It's not just the abstract church, it is unity. And so it is unity that must demonstrate God's love in the most visible and tangible ways possible. Now, I believe that this church does this every single week in many, many ways. 
And most of those ways probably go under the radar of the majority of the congregation because the church is doing so much. We're just not aware of all that the church is really doing. And so I think part of our job as pastors is trying to highlight for you the work of the church that otherwise might just be going on and going on unseen. So let me give you an example of, of one, uh, one way that this church has demonstrated God's love recently. So several months ago, there was a crash involving a helicopter full of Marines in California. You may have read about this this past week in our church newsletter. But that crash, five Marines were killed. And that happened all the way in California. But there was a local connection uh, with the family that survived. And so one of our congregation members came to the mission board and said, can we do something? I know it's all the way, you know, on the West Coast, but is there some way that we can show them uh, that we are still praying for them, that, that we love them even in the midst of this tragedy? Can we send them a, a care package? And the mission board said, well, absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's do it. And so they put together a care package that would be sent to the squadron uh, in California that had that loss. And each of the three pastors, we wrote, wrote a handwritten note to go in to that care package. Well, several weeks ago, we got a response. We got, we got a thank you note. And, and I wanted to read it um, to you because it's a thank you note to the church to the body of Christ, reaching further than just here in our community. Uh, here's what one of the squadron leaders said. He said, I just wanted to say thank you for the kind words from your church and others who wrote notes. I appreciate the snacks and sodas, especially the cheer wine, because you definitely can't find that in California. They remind me of home. I took some of the snacks and sodas for myself, but I took the rest into my squadron and gave them to my hard-working Marines, all of them from the ages of 18 to 22, who always are looking for some snacks or caffeine. It means a lot to me, but also to the men and women here who do amazing things every single day that people think of them. Thank you again for the thoughts, prayers, and the gifts. Every single week, this church does something like that where they demonstrate God's love in a visible way, in a tangible way that someone experiences. And it's our job to highlight them, to say, look, this is the work of the church that we are all about because we are the body of Christ. And so we, in every situation that we find ourselves in, are to act as Jesus would have acted if Jesus were here today. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. Now, how can we make sure that the body continues to act as it should? Well, think about your own body. Uh, you need to fuel it with food, right? To, to make sure you have enough energy to act as you want to act. Uh, you need to exercise to make sure your muscles are strong enough to do what you want to do. In short, you need to take care of your body in order for it to function well. Well, we also need to take care of the body of Christ so that Christ's body can function well. And Jesus has a plan for how to do that. And that comes a little bit later in Ephesians. It comes in chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 11. It comes by giving gifts to the church that empower and equip the church. Here's what Paul says. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Okay, so notice that there's different roles, uh, different gifts that Jesus gave to the church in order for the church to be well equipped, in order to be the body and to be a healthy body in the world. It's like in any real body where you've got different um, gifts, different organs that really uh, ensure that your body is doing what it needs to do. For example, think of your own body. You've got kidneys, right? That act as your filters in your body and they remove waste from your body. You need your liver to help with metabolism, digestion. You need your stomach to store food. You need your heart to pump blood. 
all of these body parts are essential for your body to work properly. Well, it turns out the body of Christ also has these certain roles that almost act like essential organs in the body. Paul lists the roles of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Now, before we get to the specifics of what those roles do in the church, I want you to notice that they all serve the same overarching purpose. Did you notice that? All five of these roles are designed and meant to equip the body of Christ. Equip the body in order for the body to be built up. A healthy body needs to be growing, right? As you raise children and grandchildren, you want to see them reach their milestones as they grow and mature. Well, the church is supposed to grow as well. It's supposed to be built up, Paul says. But in order to grow, we must be well equipped. So this is where these five roles come in. They are roles that help equip the church to do the work of God. So briefly, let's, let's look at uh, these roles and how they might function in the church. So Paul lists the apostles. And apostles are those commissioned by the church for a specific purpose. Now, in unity, in today's church, we might use the term elder. We might say elder because an elder is commissioned for a three-year period of time to be a leader of the church. And we say, okay, you are set apart, you are commissioned to do this important work. The next one would be prophets. And prophets, those who make known the will of God. Now remember, prophets don't necessarily predict the future. That can happen, but that's not the primary role of a prophet. Instead, a prophet is someone who has a sense of where God is leading in a particular time and is willing to speak up about that. Really, prophets are people of discernment. The next role is evangelist, uh, those who proclaim the gospel message. Now, again, this is not necessarily going door to door. Thank goodness, because we're Presbyterians. That would make us very uncomfortable. But it, it's those words. It's those actions that point to the good news of Jesus. I bet you all are familiar with someone in your life who is so good at inviting others to church. It just flows naturally out of them. Uh, this might be a term Paul would use, say you're an evangelist. Then there's the pastors, and pastors are those who shepherd the church. Now, we say shepherd because the same noun in the Greek language that's used for pastor is used for shepherd because it's the same function. Pastors are meant to shepherd the congregation, to make sure the congregation is, is healthy and heading in the right direction. Uh, we are to do the best we can to instruct you on God's word. And then we shepherd you through the stages of life, through baptism, through illness, through funerals. And then finally, you have teachers. And teachers obviously are those who teach the faith. And we need teachers in every age group, in every life stage. People need to be taught the faith. Uh, that uh, includes our very youngest disciples. Think about those who are in the nursery right now. How do they learn about the faith? Well, they learn simply by being around someone who shows them love, where they feel deep within them that they are cared for when they come to this church. That's teaching faith at that age. And we need that all the way up through our children, our middle and high schoolers, all the way to our adults. In every life stage, God provides teachers to teach the faith. Now, as you look at these roles, I don't want you to think that you are locked into one of these roles. Like, oh, that is who I am. That's all that I do in this church. Instead, I believe that in different phases of your life and different phases of the life of the church, God may use you to do different things. At different times, you may be a teacher and find yourself teaching the faith. At other times, you may be more like a prophet, where you are seeking God's will in a certain season of discernment. But remember, all of these roles, everything here is given for the same purpose, and it is to equip 
your fellow congregation members to do the work of God in this world. We need to be equipped to act like the body of Christ here at Unity. Now, as a quick aside, I want you to notice that the role of pastor is but one of the five roles that are mentioned here on this list. There's no hierarchy on this list. Each one of the other four roles is just as important as the role of pastor. In the Presbyterian Church, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. And that means that God equips all of us in order to lead this church together. Uh, Pastors may be more visible because we're up front more often, but it takes all of us, all of us to lead this church. Now, how do we know if we're on track? I mean, God has given us these gifts, these roles to really empower his body. But how do we know if we're growing well, if we're hitting those milestones, right? I mean, think of the milestones that a parent looks for. A parent might be wondering, is my child growing properly? And and to know that, you go to the pediatrician. And you're given, usually, um, the child's height and weight and how that compares to the other heights and weights of children their age. And so I know when I take one of my girls uh, to the pediatrician, uh, I am given those. um, And so it indicates, uh, is the child tall for their age? Are they short in stature? Are they gaining enough weight? These appointments serve as checkups to make sure that their bodies are growing properly. Do we have the same sort of checkups here at the church? Well, I think so. I think so based on what Paul says in the next verse. Paul says this, meaning this growth, this maturity of the church, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So as I read that, I say, okay, I see two milestones, two milestones that each church is seeking to hit as they grow and mature. You've got unity in faith and knowledge of God's Son. Both of these things should be present in the life of a robust church. And when they are, you can be confident that that church is growing into the, what Paul calls the full stature of Christ. Now, I read that list and I I wonder, why did Paul choose those two things, unity and knowledge? I mean, Paul could have chosen anything, right? Paul could have said, you are maturing in the faith when you are serving the poor or when you're loving one another. And both of those things would have been true. But I wonder if you can do those things if you are not in unity. I wonder if you can do those things without really the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. It seems to me that unity and knowledge of God's Son, they act as the foundation in which everything else in the church kind of builds upon. None of them happen without these two attributes. We need unity. We need knowledge. When I pastored a church in Tampa, I was a part of a group in the presbytery, and we met with churches that were nearing the end of their ministry, uh, churches that were nearing the point of closing. And I can remember going to to one church and meeting with two elders, and they were giving me a, a tour of the facilities. And the church was in a growing area of Tampa, And it was an older facility, but it was well-maintained, well-kept up. And as I walked around the church, I just wondered to myself, why is this church closing? Why did this church not make it? And I actually asked one of the elders. I said, why do you think things didn't work out with this church? Why do you think this church is closing? And I will never forget his response to that question. He said, I knew we lost our way when most session meetings devolved into arguing about the paint colors. It took me a second, but he continued to talk, and he said, we lost our vision. We lost our vision of who we were supposed to be as a church, uh, of what God was calling us to, and we ended up just squabbling about things that didn't really matter. Things like what color we're painting the walls in the education building. Yes, 
that speaks to unity within a church. And unity in a church doesn't mean that everyone agrees on everything. That's impossible when you're bringing this many people together. But notice that Paul says it's unity in the faith. Unity about the things that really matter. It's a shared vision of where your church is headed. And that's one thing that this church, this church didn't have anymore. I think it's not just unity and faith that is essential for the maturity of the body of Christ. But we see also it is knowledge, knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, I pray that every week that you come here, you learn something. And I want whatever it is that you're learning, that you can apply that right away to your life, a way that you can then inform the way that you live, uh, the decisions that you make, the way that you're outside these walls of this church. Now, this word knowledge here, it implies more than just head knowledge. It's, it's more than simply memorizing the Ten Commandments or, or memorizing some scriptures, although those things are, are great and I encourage that. But this kind of knowledge implies a personal understanding and love of Jesus. It is an applied knowledge. It's knowledge of Jesus that, that spurs us on into a completely new way of being. When you have that, when you have that applied knowledge to say, okay, I understand the scriptures not just here, but right here as well. Think about what that does for the foundation of a church. Think about what that does for the foundation of the body of Christ as we are growing and maturing together. Because I believe that when church has unity in faith and knowledge of God's Son, that you'll know you're on the right track of maturing into the body of Christ. Now, we're going to continue exploring these metaphors over the next three weeks. And as we do, I hope you will explore your own role within this church. Where is God seeking you to use your gifts? Where can you deepen your involvement in God's work together? Let us be the body of Christ that this world most desperately needs. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.